Good morning, everybody, and Happy New Year. Slightly belated Happy New Year, but this is our first event uh, of two, uh, 2021 from the Daiwa Foundation. So um, my name is Jason James, and I'll just run you through um, how we're going to do this. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it already. Um, so let's have the slides, if my colleagues can share them. Yeah. So we're launching uh, this book from Cambridge University, Beyond Kauai, um, and we've got quite a few speakers, so I'll try and get through this all quickly. Um, everybody is muted um, in the audience, and you will remain muted during the actual talk. So you're very welcome to use the chat function. We often have quite an active chat going on, and you can comment or question uh, in that. We encourage people to be a bit more interactive than many Zoom seminars. So um, we quite like it if we can see where you are. So I've, I've changed my name um, so that I've got Cambridge, which happens to be where I live. Um, and we quite like it if you leave your video on, although of course it's entirely up to you and then we can all see each other. Uh, and we are recording. So if you don't want to be recorded, then you better turn your video off. Um, then when we get to the Q and A session at the end, uh, it's best to do it using the Zoom function for raise your hand. So I'll just show you how to do this in case you haven't done it before. Um, if you go to participants uh, or sankasha in, in Japanese, uh, there's a button that says raise hand or te o ageru, and that is uh, ringed there in blue. If you click on that, a little blue hand should come up next to your name. And that means we know you want to ask a question. So we'll then ask you to unmute yourself. We'll let you unmute yourself and you can ask a question. Um, I think I've mentioned most of this. Uh, yeah, do feel free to use the feedback icons if you want to, uh, to applaud and that kind of thing. Um, okay, next slide. So I, I'm only mentioning here uh, the sort of main speakers. We've got several more coming later, but most of us are in Cambridge. Um, we've got Angelica joining us. Um, well, she's actually in Vienna, but she's teaching at Leiden. So I'm not quite sure. We've got Leiden here, have we? Right. Uh, and I'll just introduce them very briefly. Um, so uh, Dr. Brigitte Steger is Senior Lecturer in Modern Japanese Studies at Cambridge University. Um, and she has a fairly wide range of research topics, including plastic bag use. Um, and she's also Secretary General of the Japan Anthropology Workshop. Uh, and then Dr. Angelika Koch uh, is Assistant Professor in Pre-Modern Japanese History at the Institute for Area Studies at Leiden University, um, but she's doing it remotely at the moment from Vienna uh, and specialises in sexuality and health discourses in pre-modern Japan. And Christopher Tso, uh, the third editor of the book, um, has recently completed his PhD at Cambridge exploring male grooming practices, and he currently teaches uh, at Cambridge. Uh, in the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. And then we'll have uh, contributions from these four, also from Cambridge uh, later on, but I won't give you any details about them. Uh, and this is the timeline. So we're gonna try and keep to this um, so that we finish the actual presentations by 12.45, which should leave us 15 minutes or more for Q and A. We'll run on a bit beyond uh, one o'clock if people feel they want to. And uh, they are giving away free copies of the book Beyond Kawaii. So you can only qualify to enter this competition to get a free copy by asking a question. Um, so if you ask a question, we'll put your name in a hat and uh, we'll tell you who has won at the end of all of this. And then you'll need to contact uh, Brigitte. We'll put this email address up again, uh, but you'll need to contact Brigitte um, so that she can know where to send the book to. So that, I think, is my intro, and I'm going to hand over now to Brigitte. Okay, thank you very much. We I will share the presentation with you. Uh, and uh, just now share PowerPoint view. And oops, where is it? It's disappeared, sorry. Here it is. Um, so, um, my name is Brigitte Stege, and I'm uh, very happy to welcome you to this online celebration of our new book, uh, 
beyond Kawaii studying Japanese femininities at Cambridge. I'm a senior lecturer uh, at the Department of Japanese Studies and also chair the Japanese Gender Studies Group, which is a group of mostly uh, students. Uh, so I tried to arrange the slides that uh, there is a little bit of space on the right side. So if you want to put all the uh, other things you have to want to see on the right side, that might be quite helpful. Um, so, sorry. So uh, I want to give you, before we talk about the book itself, a little bit of a background of how this book and the series of where the book came out uh, started. And this is a book written by former students, or actually students who did this during their final year when they were uh, at Cambridge. And Cambridge is, of course, uh, well famous, but it's also a very good course. It's very intensive uh, teaching of language and not only language, but about uh, Japanese culture, society, history, literature, uh, etc. We have the luxury to have very small uh, classes. So this is a whole year group uh, in this case. Sometimes it's a bit more. Uh, we also have one-on-one uh, -on -one teaching and we ask our students to do quite a lot of uh, teaching, uh, uh, studying themselves both in the library and so on. So they get very busy, but they also get busy with lots of extracurricular activities like uh, cooking Japanese food or trying to rakugo kind of lectures and so on. Uh, but one of the highlights of the course is actually not in Cambridge, but it is going to Japan on in the third year. And this is often the time when they discover, um, have experiences or discover interesting phenomena they want to learn more about. And uh, they do this, what uh, in Japan would be a sotsugyo rombon or in, in Cambridge, we call it dissertation. And uh, they start getting ideas, uh, talking about it, finding out more about, about this and get in contact with their supervisors in, in Cambridge and develop a research uh, topic. And this topic, uh, range of topics our students take is very wide. So it's not only about gender, it can be classical literature, it can be history, it can be uh, modern literature, politics, uh, uh, and so on. And uh, with this dissertation, of course, they have to bring together lots of the skills they achieved, uh, both the language, but also uh, asking research questions, finding use and using primary sources and secondary sources or use of a, a library. Perhaps they do interviews or participant observation, analyzing material and presenting it both verbally, so they are questioned them by their teachers uh, or also as a, as a written piece of work. And uh, I have been working in Cambridge for 14 years now. So one of the things I observed is there were quite a lot of very interesting and original uh, pieces of work done and uh, a lot of work went into them. So often one or two years, uh, the main uh, project they had and, uh, and really interesting, but no one ever read it except for the supervisor and the examiners. So I wanted to, uh, Think of I thought of a publication and of course when you think about a book uh, then you have to get uh, pieces of work that can fit together also content wise and um, we turned this into a project so uh, at this time Angelica Koch was still a PhD student and uh, so there's also a project to for PhD students to learn how to edit a book and we went back and forth of course editing also needs you need to have a focus, you need to uh, talk about the area of research. And uh, it happens to be as if it was planned all about gender. And it also happens to be kind of a continuation from the first book in 2013 was Manga Girls Except for Boy. Then the next one in 2017, Cool Japanese Men. And now uh, we have a book Beyond Kawaii about the uh, femininities. Uh, we also do the whole, um, layout and uh, and the uh, title uh, ourselves so we commission with uh, young students uh, uh, the artwork and one of our former students is doing the layout of this of this book and so with um, so what we want to do is not only to actually make this very interesting research available for 
um, the whole world, but also inspire young people so that they maybe also have ideas of how to go, to go about and to have a bit of a companion when they try to do that, to know how you could perhaps do it. It does not mean that Cambridge only has uh, gender studies people, but um, it's certainly one of the uh, one of the areas which is very important when you study uh, Japan. So, and with this in mind, I ask Angelica and Chris to explain a little bit about the, the content of the book. Thank you. So, this, uh, this. first of all, uh, thanks a lot to everyone for joining us today and for the Diver Foundation for having us. Um, so, my name is Angelica Koch, and I'm one of the co-editors of this book. And as Brigitte already mentioned, together with her, I've been involved as editor in all three volumes of this, of this series. Um, and when we started out seven or eight years ago with the first book, I was still doing my PhD at Cambridge and it was quite a steep learning curve for me. Um, but I think this really crystallizes as well what this whole series has been about, namely, um, it's been about teaching and mentoring young scholars and about giving them a platform and giving visibility to their excellent work and helping them in taking their first steps in publishing or, as in my case, in editing in a very supportive academic environment. And so now that we tackle gender more generally in the first volume of the series and then masculinities in the second, the kind of logical progression, of course, was to now give center stage to femininities. And Japanese women have, of course, long fascinated the Western mind, but for younger, younger generations, one of the dominant images of women that they are confronted with all the time is that of kawaii or cuteness. And this has become such a successful cultural export in Japan's so-called pink globalization that the word kawaii now already appears, in fact, in standard English dictionaries. But kawaii is more than just pink hearts and smiley faces and cute characters like Hello Kitty, etc. It's not just an aesthetic that is being consumed through goods, um, but it's also something that women in particular sometimes also wish to embody themselves in their behavior, for example, through their fashion choices, such as you can see here in the image, or also through their modes of expression. So we could, we could also say that, that it's a kind of gender type uh, or even a stereotype. Anna, for example, shows this very well in her chapter, and she shows how kawaii aesthetic can be one way of mainstreaming uh, chubby bodies, for example, for younger girls in Japan. Uh, but there's certainly also a need to look beyond this uh, one type, uh, and this is, of course, something that we try to do in the book, as the title would have it. Uh, while kawaii may be a guiding principle for girls, for example, its ubiquity can also obscure the different ideals of femininities that exist in Japan and that are based on age and social status. And it also obscures the shifting challenges that women face in, in Japanese society. And many of these are of course rooted, as you probably know, in the post-war family system. And that the core of this system was a heterosexual nuclear family structure. And this generally envisaged the middle-class woman as a so-called professional housewife who would provide total care for their salaryman husbands while also carrying out reproductive work uh, that is raising children and taking care of the household. And these gendered structures have been very deeply ingrained in the fabric of post-war Japanese society and the economy as well. And they've proven quite persistent and remain influential even to this day. And now I'm going to hand over to Chris. Chris. Okay, hello, thank you. So I am Chris Fisso, uh, one of the co-editors. Uh, my research is actually on men in Japanese society, but uh, of course you can't understand uh, women or men without understanding uh, the other. Um, and Denise, so as Angelica was saying, this post-war gender structure of men, you know, must be full-time breadwinners and, and women must devote themselves to uh, domestic labour. This ideology has remained in contemporary society, uh, despite a lot of policy and discourse stressing the need to rethink gender roles, and in particular to increase a woman's labour force participation. Um, this is perhaps most evident in the now former Prime Minister Abe Shinzo's 
the so-called uh, womanomics policies set out in 2013. And so these, these policies, they were very ambitious. They wanted to increase uh, childcare facilities so that more women could devote themselves to work, um, in particular in flexible roles. Um, and then also these policies had these very ambitious quota targets, for instance, to have you know 30% of uh, corporate board member positions occupied by women uh, by 2020. Um, in one promotional poster, which has become quite notorious now for womanomics, uh, Abe is urging women to shine in English. And in fact, if you pronounce shine in Japanese, shine, it turns into the imperative form of the verb uh, to die. So an alternative reading is that Abe is actually urging women to, to die. Um, and so this rather unfortunate oversight is perhaps some indication that the plans of womanomics weren't really thoroughly thought out. So much of womanomics is not legally binding, but it merely calls upon or urges companies to change. So in fact, you know, these ambitious quota targets uh, have not been met, not by a long shot. And fundamentally, the gender, the orthodox gender ideology remains where it is men who are assumed to be the natural full-time breadwinners and only help out a little bit domestically. Meanwhile, women need to work more, but they also still need to take primary responsibility of managing uh, domestic labor. Um, so while on the surface then the government uh, has made a lot of progress in, in realizing legal equality, it actually the social realities stand in stark contrast, which means that in fact, this official legal progress in many ways obscures and reinforces gendered inequalities. Um, and so that's what we show uh, throughout this book that, that women are constrained that women face cause to shine, to take on new roles, to kind of go beyond kawaii, but they're still burdened by these orthodox expectations. Um, so what we see then is a lot of contradictions and tensions, and as a result there's a lot of complexity and variation in how individual women negotiate and find meaning in their lives. Um, and so that's what we see throughout all the chapters, um, and so with that I'm now going to pass over to Ellen Mann, who's going to uh, speak about her chapter. So, Ellen, over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Ellen Mann, and I graduated from Cambridge two years ago. My chapter, which is the first of the undergraduate pieces of work, is, I think, best introduced with the anecdote that I use in the book as well, which is that in 2018, the Japanese uh, version of Elle magazine posted an article entitled Focus on Vagina Power that received a very negative uh, reaction on Japanese Twitter. In the article, a specialist in phytotherapy, which is a kind of herbal medicine, encourages women to exercise their vagina, have sex, and monitor their menstrual blood because, she writes, the vagina is not only responsible for everything related to your overall happiness, but a cosmos that expresses everything about you. That extract is a characteristic example of what Japanese pundits term shikyuke and chitsuke, or uterus and vagina type spirituality, which promise women that by correctly managing their reproductive organs, they can empower and express themselves in a way that is cosmically significant. That all might sound quite obscure, but these two trends, shitsuke, shikyuke and chitsuke, uh, form part of a transnational new age culture of consumer spirituality that we frequently see in the UK and beyond as well, blending together aspects of self-help, alternative medicine and religion. The new age marketplace invites women as consumers primarily to fulfill themselves and change their own lives, whether by embarking on spiritual tourism as preached by the best-selling book, Eat, Pray, Love, or by carrying a jade egg in their vagina, as much more controversially recommended by actress Gwyneth Paltrow. Faced with the combined pressures to devo devote themselves to economic participation alongside domestic and maternal duties that Christopher has just addressed, where might Japanese women seek relief? Well, it seems natural that the new age, pop spirituality and alternative healing uh, are the answers to that question and a way for them to regain a sense of control over their own fortunes. In my chapter, I bring the broader shifts in Japanese women's expected lifestyles into dialogue with this particular part of popular culture, 
by analyzing shikyuke and chitsuke health, beauty, and lifestyle advice in Japanese women's magazines, as well as more radical texts. What can these sources tell us about attitudes to women, their bodies, and what can we infer from the way they tell women to live their lives? Across my sources, the ideal woman that emerges is not focused on kawaii cuteness, but she's always proactively feminine and she's on a quest of mystic self-actualization. A feminist rhetoric, or seemingly feminist, of women empowering and expressing themselves, which resonates with the national call for them to shine, as Christopher mentioned, is intertwined with notions of feminine purity, inadequacy, biological essentialism, and highly normative expectations of what it is women should want. The mystery of the spiritual and the new age is used to repackage beautifying consumption and body discipline as a false escape for women, asking them to look to their own bodies and their own reproductive capacity for the answers to their life's problems, instead of challenging a social system that undeserves them. I'll now hand over to Vesper to introduce our second chapter, fittingly on motherhood. Uh, okay, thank you, Alan. Um, so I'm Vesper here, and I became a student of Japanese studies at Cambridge in 2014. And last October, I finished uh, a master's in film and screen studies, also in Cambridge, in which uh, I continued my research on Japanese femininity. And so for this chapter, along the line of issues associated with fertility, which is always simultaneously political and personal, I look at Japan's declining birth rate from the perspective of the transition from womanhood to motherhood. So in other words, what causes becoming a mother so difficult a choice to make that many women are delaying marriage and childbirth in Japan? And how is the femininity of a woman reconstructed when she does become a mother? So for the first question, this dilemma of choice is explained by two categories of common claims regarding various social and political promotions of both marriage and motherhood. Concerning marriage, many women consider that marriage does not only in many cases replace work as a material safety net, it also serves as an emotional one. This possibility of being socially viewed as lacking an emotional safety net adds to the pressure to marriage. And when it comes to motherhood, women have continued to bear the primary responsibility for household chores and child rearing. And that is whether or not the wife continues to work after marriage. And due to the fact that in recent years, it is more common for both the husband and the wife to work instead of a single income family structure. This typical experience for most Japanese women makes becoming a mother a more challenging choice to make. And regarding the second question, I explore how a woman's identity changes when she becomes a mother as described in popular pregnancy and parenting magazines. Through reading these magazines, I find that the terminology they use highlight what is regarded crucial in this transition from womanhood to motherhood. So for instance, the word haha, which is the normative term for referring to a mother is used in relatively serious context such as expressing one's determination to become a good mother. While mama, a more recent and westernized form of address is used in any other occasions, basically. So it's used in order to embrace kind of a fashionable image. And this leads to another perspective that all these magazines suggest a notion that a woman shouldn't give up her freedom to enjoy fashion after, or especially after she becomes a mother. And on top of that, if she's not sure how to do so, she should go for kileme, a style that is more inclined towards being elegant and sophisticated than any other particular style. So for example, a mother is not supposed to be overly cute, be overly kawaii anymore. She needs to literally go beyond that. And this ability to enjoy fashion during pregnancy but also to grasp the perfect choice of kileme style is viewed as essential. That is, these magazines promote a new mama identity and to accomplish this, it's semi-compulsory to be elegantly dressed, sophisticated, successful and happy, both at work and at home. So at the end of this chapter and this presentation, we've come to yet another debate 
does this new mama identity mean increasing diversity of choices for women, or does it normalize the amount of effort involved to become a mother, and thus risk being counterproductive in terms of tackling issues associated with a declining birth rate? I'll end it there. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Alexandra. Thanks very much, Vespera. Uh, so I'm Alexander Russell. I graduated with a degree in Japanese studies from Cambridge in 2019, uh, and I'm now working as a civil servant in the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. So it was during my second year at Cambridge that I really discovered the world of modern Japanese literature. And while I found many books that retained places on my list of favourites, it was Kanehara Hitomi's Snakes and Earrings that really captured my attention and left me wanting to know more and to read more. The forthright brutality and honesty in the depiction of the life of the iconoclastic protagonist Louis stuck out against the serenity and delicacy of the Kawabata and Soseki that are often conjured up at the mention of Japanese literature. Kanehara's was an uncompromising, confrontational, and above all, critical female voice that defied almost every aspect of the stereotypical, traditional Japanese woman. So when I picked up a one yen copy of the work that forms the focus of my chapter, her untranslated 2009 work, Trip Trap, I expected more of the same. Sex, violence, and individuals on the margin of society rebelling against the status quo. But Trip Trap presents the opposite, six short stories of women between the ages of 15 and 25, who, though they start as truant teenagers, become wives and mothers endeavoring to live up to the pressures of being Ryo Sai Kenbo, good wives and wise mothers. I argue that Kanehara's critical voice comes through all the stronger as she turns her attention to marriage and relationships and motherhood, two of the cornerstones of societal expectations of women in Japan. In Trip Trap, Kanehara strays away from the scandalous and extreme, instead developing psychological portraits of daily life, predominantly unfolding in the internal monologue of the narrators as they navigate the difficulties they face in life because of their gender. They are wives and girlfriends frustrated by their ignorant and oblivious partners, and mothers being made to go, to, go it alone while the fathers are absent from home life, perhaps familiar characters for some. I argue that it is precisely this familiarity, this universality, that makes the critical voice of Trip Trap so significant and, above all, so hard to ignore. While Kanehara's earlier work is, to the average reader, further in the realms of the fictional, most people don't have too much experience of the underground Tokyo S&M and body modification scene, Trip Trap is recognisably real. Though the six stories are distinct, self-contained works, the fact that they are united by the name of the narrator, Mayu, gives the reader pause to consider the connections between them all. Kanehara encourages us to see the struggles faced by the individual narrators, not as one-off snapshots of oppression and inequality, but rather as parts of the whole, the female process, as Kanehara labels it. This female process is one of transformation, which Kanehara places at the heart of traditional femininity, turning the teenager of the first work, cut off from normal life by her controlling boyfriend, to the mother of the last work, beleaguered and exhausted by the expectations of motherhood. Thank you very much. And I'll now pass on to Anna uh, for her next presentation. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna ellis Reese, and I graduated in 2018 along with Vespera. Um, like Alex, I also work as a civil servant at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, so this chapter is a comparative analysis of Japan's dieting industry and its more recent body positivity movement. For a little bit of background, Japan has the lowest obesity rate in the developed world. And that's something that's often attributed to the typical Japanese diets, which many claim to be one of the healthiest in the world. However, when I visited Japan for the first time on my year abroad, I was really surprised to see that food was not as strikingly healthy as I had anticipated. Food sold in convenience stores and restaurants ranged from highly nutritious to oily, sugary, deep fried, just like anywhere in the world. What was actually more noticeable to me was the pressure to be thin and to lose weight. And the more I looked, the more I would see this everywhere I went. Um, in clothes shops where I would see supposedly one size fits all trousers and skirts 
um, in university canteens where strict calorific breakdowns were provided for every meal. And even in doing karaoke, when you're told how many calories you've burned after each song, it's really quite an inescapable phenomenon. And while this pressure definitely exists across Japanese society, I noticed that dieting crazes and weight loss products were particularly targeted at women, uh, which is interesting given the rising rates of underweight young girls and women with eating disorders in Japan. In spite of this, I couldn't quite shake off my curiosity about the women who don't adhere to this slim norm within Japanese society. These women are often ridiculed in Japanese media and reduced to lazy, childish stereotypes. That's when I came across something completely unexpected in the early stages of my research, which was a music video from a pop idol girl group called Chubbiness. As the name suggests, Chubbiness act as representatives for larger girls, and their music is based around themes of love of food and self-acceptance. As it turns out, Chubbiness make up part of this wider body positivity movement, or Pocheribumu in Japan, which includes other plus size groups, um, shop selling plus size clothes and plus size magazines. But behind lyrics and imagery of happiness, confidence and female solidarity, I actually observed more negative undertones of self-deprecation as well as competitiveness and a critical judgment towards slimmer women. It was this dissonance that really inspired me to write this chapter. I look at both intentionally negative and intentionally positive depictions of the larger female body across different examples of Japanese media, such as television commercials for dieting products and music videos, to compare and contrast how each type of media represents female weight. My principal finding is that in spite of the differing purposes of this media, both types define a woman's value by the shape of her body and only accept chubbiness, as Dr. Steger mentioned earlier, amongst younger girls as an aesthetic kawaii trend. In fact, the supposedly positive media often displays what I term a pseudo fat acceptance, rather than a genuinely compassionate view of weight. I ultimately find that both types of media encourage tribalism and a divide between women of different shapes and sizes, which in turn strengthens rather than dismantles the patriarchal idealization of slimness. Uh, thank you very much. I'll now hand back over to Vesper to present her second chapter. Thank you, Anna, and uh, it's me again. Um, in this chapter, I explore the gender performance of Ikemen Danso Joshi, or handsome cross-dressing girls, and a portrait of the ideal gender in their definition. Danso is a used subcultural practice in which girls, mostly in their teenage years or early 20s, cross-dress as boys and negotiate gender through fashion, linguistic practice, and body languages. And these girls don't just cross-dress to be any boys, they have a preference for manga or anime aesthetics. So the ikemen or handsome in this context specifically means the kind of physical appearance that resembles a manga protagonist or someone that is unreal to a certain degree. So these are some examples of what ikemen danso joshi will look like. As you can see, they adopt an androgynous or boyish fashion instead of trying to 100% pass as men. So this preferred manga aesthetics makes danso overlap with cosplay another use of cultural practice of dressing or cross-dressing as a certain manga character. And this is one example of that overlap. It's uh, the next slide. It's my Danso cosplay back in 2016, during my year abroad studying at Keio Daigaku. And it was at Komi Market, one of the biggest convention for manga fans in Tokyo. On that day, Another Danso cosplayer who carried a camera with her politely asked me if she could take photos of and with me, and if I had a Twitter account so she could send me the photos afterwards. I stayed at the event for a very short time that day actually, and it was interesting that the few people who came and talked to me that day were all Danso cosplayers. My experience at Komi Market brings to me a question posed by sociologist Oshiyama Michiko that why do I have a desire for dancehall characters? 
And this is also to some extent an overarching question that my chapter attempts to answer. I will leave you to read the book to find out more. And I will conclude my presentation by suggesting that Ikemen Danso girls craft an alternative gender identity that is opposed to both normative masculinity and normative femininity. And by cross, uh, crossing the stereotypical boundaries of gender, they demonstrate a desire to pursue their own ideals of individuality and self-expression. And again, most Ikemen Danso girls that I can find primary literature on uh, or during their adolescence, or a phase of extended adolescence, which is defined less by the age and more by the so-called stages of life. So it will be interesting to do some follow-ups on the Ikemen Dan Soju uh, uh, gender performances, when issues such as marriage and motherhood come into picture. And thank you. I will hand over back to Anna again. Thanks, Aspera. Um, so the final chapter is based on my final year dissertation, when I decided to take a bit of a gamble and write about something I've been fascinated by for years, which is horror film. Horror films tend to be extremely divisive. You either love them or you absolutely can't stand them. I happen to love them. For me, what's so captivating about horror is what these films tell us about ourselves, not only in the sense of our most primal fears, but also the social and political issues that we as a society are preoccupied with at the time um, a horror film is made. And as such, the role of women in horror can provide us with a real insight into gender roles of a particular society at a particular time. Now, when you think of women in horror, you might first imagine a young woman screaming, being chased and tormented by a male serial killer, perhaps brandishing an ax or a chainsaw, or you might consider on the opposite end of the spectrum, the many kinds of female monsters that we see within the genre. And these range from unforgiving ghosts to jealous lovers seeking revenge, to possessed children and teenagers discovering their supernatural powers. Interestingly, these female antagonists are nearly always feared for their very femaleness, which might be sexual development or sexual power, it might be for menstruation and reproduction, or even just for displaying a hysterical tendency as the stereotype goes. In this chapter, I discuss three Japanese horror films, Ringu, Juon, and Audition, which all fall into this category of depicting monstrous femininity. Each has a central female antagonist who is seeking revenge for their mistreatment at the hands of a man to whom they were close. What these women have in common, and what I really focus on in this chapter, is that while they are very much frightening figures, they are also tragically victims of gendered abuse. And it's this original abuse that drives their very monstrosity and violent revenge that is so key to the narrative. I argue that this hybridity of monstrosity and victimhood reflects women's reality at the times the films were released. All three came out in the late 1990s and early 2000s, otherwise known as Japan's lost decade, which was a time of significant socioeconomic change and shifting gender roles as a result of the burst of the economic bubble in 1991. As in the films, during this lost decade, the modern woman was often viewed in the media as a, a threat to the family unit and by extension to national stability as a whole. But behind closed doors, many continued to be subject to domestic and sexual abuse. I build on this societal reading by also taking a psychoanalytical approach and exploring the films with a particular focus on the male gaze and how the female antagonists challenge but ultimately fail to subvert this subjectivity. I think the main takeaway from my chapter is that we as viewers should shift our perspective or our, our own gaze, if you like, and see these women not simply as monsters, but more as an ambiguous image, or in other words, a whole made up of two seemingly contrasting parts. And to sum up, I, I think that this point on ambiguous imagery really ties in well with what collectively Beyond Kawaii is all about as an anthology, which is the idea that Japanese women are like all women across the world, not simply one dimensional or easy to define, but are complex beings made up of not only their cultural, social, political, economic backgrounds, but also their own individual experiences. 
thank you. I'll hand back over to Dr. Steger, I think. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I hope you got a very good insight into uh, the kind of themes that are discussed in this book and also the exciting approaches uh, of our students. Uh, the book is obviously available also for purchase um, uh, and for free in some ways. So for purchase, it's a paperback, but also an ebook. although that we seem to have had some difficulties actually getting the publisher to uh, show this on their homepage uh, properly, but uh, there is an ebook version. So in these times, that's perhaps uh, uh, preferable. Uh, you can also find directly on the faculty website on the first page, I asked to put this on today, uh, that we give away some free copies to UK schools, so only the maintained sector. Uh, if you uh, know young people or you are yourself uh, uh, young and, um, and you can ask the librarian and they, there is a form and just ask for a free copy. You get it for free without anything uh, you have to do uh, for it. But you're also, uh, of course, uh, in a few minutes able to uh, win a book tonight. I also wanted to uh, refer to some more information about Japanese studies at Cambridge. Uh, uh, some of our former students have created a YouTube channel and uh, present their own experience in this. And of course, the faculty website that you can uh, also see.